Thank you. Um, all those things are true. Yeah, I've been, I've been fired, hired, and uh, purchased, and I've purchased other people. So I have done it all, I think. Uh, I am, some people call me a, one of the pioneers of the information technology industry. Uh, and I have won uh, considerable recognition for the contribution and the use of technology in the area of, uh, of uh, management as well. Uh, but uh, I have another distinction I would just as soon not have, and it also kind of represents the bridge between my life as an entrepreneur and my life as an author. And that is in 2004, I was diagnosed with stage four colon cancer. And probably there are a lot of people in this room who have you haven't had to deal with this yourself, you have family members or someone that you know that's gone through cancer. So you know that stage four colon cancer is often a death sentence. In fact, I remember waking up in the uh, hospital and seeing my surgeon, one of my first surgeons, sitting across the room from me in one of those imitation leather chairs like you find in hospitals. We have a few doctors here tonight that can relate to that, I think waiting for me to wake up because he wanted to give me the news that I should go home and put my affairs in order because I had six months to two years maximum to live. That, uh, fortunately, was 10 years ago. I was fortunate in that I got into an experimental treatment program and uh, uh, I might say, and I'm sure I can, many of you can relate to this, that going through chemo and radiation and those processes is not easy. In fact, if you can see this, that's what I look like during the treatment process. And I remember uh, being in the treatment chair at Tennessee Oncology. It's one of the attendants was about to stick a needle into the port that I had installed so they could put some of that magic elixir into my body, and they gave me one of these medical documents, one of these waivers to sign. And I promise you, I'm not paraphrasing, it said this medication will cause premature death. Since then, I haven't bothered to read any of those waivers <laughs> to give you when you go to an office. I figure when you sign one of these, that nothing else, nothing else really, really counts. But at any rate, uh, after that experimental uh, treatment uh, obviously worked, uh, at least I'm cancer free at the present time. One never says that they're cured of this because there's always looking over your shoulder back there. Uh, but at this point, uh, my, most of my doctors would be happy if I died of a heart attack or a stroke because this way they could at least say I'm a cancer survivor, uh, important from their statistics. But uh, so far things are looking pretty good. But I retired in 2007 having won that uh, uh, at that time, and started writing at the age of 66. Uh, I was in the technology business. I owned a software company that specialized in uh, software for the practice management for uh, law firms, uh, and sold the company uh, to an organization, an international corporation called LexisNexis. Mm -hmm. Since then, I've created <coughs> seven literary works five full-length books and two smaller works. Uh, I also maintain some blogs and a newsletter under the umbrella of the language of excellence. Uh, <clears throat> all of my mysteries and my first books were mysteries. And I concentrated on writing mysteries because I was retiring from business. And for me, they were entertaining. Uh, I got started writing because after I retired, uh, my loving wife who had you know, took me for better or worse, hadn't really counted on 24-7. So she started saying, Tom, don't you have something to do? Don't you have somewhere to go? So I started writing and writing mysteries because they were entertaining for me, as well as for uh, the readers, I hope. All of my mysteries are available in hardback, paperback, uh, and as e-books for the Kindle or the Nook uh, or for iBooks. And the most recent one, which is the Claire Burgers, is also available as an audiobook. Uh, 
Uh, and of course, they're all available on, uh, as I said, on Amazon or Barnes and Noble or any of the other places or sources that you would expect them to be. But really, we're here tonight to talk about uh, my latest book, which is not a whodunit. It is not a mystery. It is uh, a business book, but it does address the mystery, and that's the mystery of leadership. I uh, would say to you that anybody can be accidentally successful. You can have your Andy Warhol 15 minutes of fame. But succeeding for the long haul is something different. You have to know what you're doing in order to do that. Uh, and hopefully, uh, the language of excellence will help you do that because it's a simple book. It'll be an easy book to read. Uh, but it has the capacity to, for you to start a conversation that can lead your team or your organization to greatness. I discovered really rather late in my career that teaching is far more effective than directing people. When everybody in the organization, from the mailroom to the accounting to the legal to whatever size your organization is, when everybody in your organization understands the basic essentials of business leadership and management, something magic happens. It's like somebody turns up the light and pulls back the curtain. The suspicion between management, if you will, and employees, if you will, goes away. And out of it, you really get a team that emerges. It crosses geographic lines. It brings people together uh, across geography into a unified uh, team that acquires a core set of beliefs, almost like a moral compass, something that guides them in how they make day-to-day -day decisions. And they gain out of that conversation a common sense of direction. It will truly make doing the right things and avoiding the wrong things a habit. In the language, of, in the book, Language of Excellence, what I tried to do was to take those proven management concepts from, from leaders like Deming of the Japanese miracle, from Peter Drucker, from Tom Peters, and others, and codify them, if you will, assign each of them a pictograph and also trigger words. And when this becomes part of the corporate speak or the company speak or the organization speak, when people use this internally, when they use these words, when they talk about things like the Mack truck problem or talk about suboptimization or the rule of the fewest uh, or or talk about uh, change, it reinforces these management concepts and it becomes organic uh, within the organization itself. Tom, can yes. you just speak a little bit louder, please? I'm just concerned. This can everybody hear me all right? They, they, they may be able to hear you, but they're videotaping and I'm concerned about the air conditioning unit. So if you could just speak a little bit louder, please. I will try my best. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, thank you. That's all right. We can also pull this microphone a little closer. You want to do that? All right, okay. Yeah. All right. My, my well, keep reminding me. It's all right. Just keep reminding me <laughs> to do that and to use the, the, the diaphragm, if you will. That's a good break, though, because one of the other things that I want to take the time to do is to say that when we get through this, I am going to give away some prizes, uh, including uh, a, a gift certificate uh, from Amazon, as well as some other interesting things as well. So we had a card for you to fill out when you come in. And if you wanted uh, to participate in that drawing, and or get a copy of my slides that I use today, I want to be sure that you have a chance to fill out that card. Uh, if you don't have the card, uh, Diane, would you help? I mean, if, you, if you'll get some of them, and people, if you just kind of indicate that you need one, she can get it to you and have you fill it out. So what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about some of the selected pictographs or images that are used in the language of excellence as to how they relate to achieving success in, in, in the long haul. 
uh, and hopefully we will build up then at the very end. And I hope to give you the absolute uh, not the absolute essential in order to do that. I use I-65 North as a metaphor for business because business like life is a journey. You're going somewhere. Uh, and in this uh, pictograph, we use North to represent that. We're going towards opportunities. And there are rules of the road for how you're going to travel. Uh, that destination. The rules of the roads are different. Uh, if you've chosen to go into the clergy, for example, the rules of that road are very different than if you've chosen that are a rock band. But there are rules of the road. There are things that are expected of you as you make that journey. But we're all individuals, and you make the journey differently. You don't, we're not robots, so people can make them at their own speed. You can't go too fast as to be uh, uh, reckless or too slow as to endanger people, and you can't go south, east, or west. The leader sets a direction. It's north. If you don't want to go north, you need to go somewhere else. You also make that journey with an understanding and acceptance that there are two certainties. You can't avoid them. These are certainties in your business. Now, Benjamin Franklin expressed those certainties in the common language of his time. He said, there are two certainties in life, death and taxes. You can't get away from them. We can update that to a little more modern terms when we talk about business, and we can say the certainties are that you are always judged by others. And that's what taxes are, they're judged by the government. But you're judged by others. You are what others see you as. You can't avoid that. Uh, your accomplishments, or what others see those accomplishments as. And the second certainty is change. It's constant. It cannot be avoided. You either change for the better, or natural forces are at work eroding you and changing you for the worse. In the book, I talk about a number of those things that relate to this aspect of being judged by others. But I'll leave that for you to read in the book. But I will talk about one of them. And yet I would say is the prerequisite. It is the thing that you have to have a zero, zero tolerance for. It is the thing that you have to demand as a leader and accept and, and require of everyone. And that is common courtesy. I use the pictograph of the smiling face with CCs as the eyes because they say that the eyes are the window into the soul. And if that's true, then common courtesy is, um, is the window into the soul of a company. You've heard, I'm sure, the expression, this would be a great organization or a great company if it wasn't for the clients or the customers. You can't accept that as a leader. You cannot tolerate that in an organization. Uh, you know, and, and uh, as I say again, you must demand common courtesy. Uh, your customers will accept nothing less. And if they have an organ, if they have an alternative, if you don't, if your organization doesn't, doesn't exercise common courtesy, and they have an alternative, I promise you, they will take it. But they're all flavors of, you know, of the missing ingredient. Uh, there's the office bully. There's the person who treats clients as a disruption. Uh, people that want to protect themselves uh, through their voicemail system and so forth. People who are rude. They have no place in the organization if you're going to try to achieve excellence, if you're going to try to exceed in, in the long term. In my mysteries, I, because I've always been involved in business, I've always tried to put in each of my mysteries a real life business problem. And in declared murders, the problem is the office bully. Um, and in a mystery, it was easy to solve the problem. We just killed him off. <laughs> well, you can't kill them, but you can't let them work for you either. 
there's no place in the organization for the office building. This is a prerequisite that you must uh, demand and insist upon. But the main thing I think we want to put our emphasis on today is the concept of change. In my statement, that you either change or you are changed for the worse. Everything has a life cycle. The chair that you're sitting uh, is going to eventually, uh, I'd like to say it's going to turn into sawdust, but since it's made of metal, <laughs> it's going to rust away. Uh, the seat's going to rot. But it has a life cycle. Things come into existence, they mature, and they begin a process of decline. Uh, everything is in the process of breaking. And what that means is that the old concept of if it ain't broke, don't fix it, is dead wrong. Because everything is breaking. You have to be in the business of fixing things before they break. You have to replace that chip before it breaks. Uh, and the process in business is really one of moving from one life cycle to another. And that's what we mean when we say you have to replace that chair, that life cycle with another chair, another life cycle. But that relates to products and services. Uh, you know, everything is in the process of breaking, going out of style, uh, becoming obsolete, of, of disappearing as a customer preference, uh, how many people still have wallpaper in the house? Yeah. Anybody got the uh, olive green refrigerator? <laughs> now, everybody wants granite now and stainless steel, but by how long, I wonder. Whatever business or activity you're in, five years from today, you will be doing that differently. You will either be delivering the process, the service or the product differently, or it will be different, or what you're operating inside of your organization in order to accomplish that will be different. You have to be in the process of moving from the life cycle to another. It happens for entire industries. I mean, think about the computer industry. Where did we start? Mainframes? And then we went to many computers, and then we went to, to, uh, to Desktop computers, and of course now we've got more computers in that telephone down there than, um, than you know, than the systems that we're probably using in today's space station up there. Certainly in the vehicles that got us to the space station and stuff. The publishing industry, as we're moving from you know from the old uh, long run uh, processes to the e-books and to print on demand. So again, you have to be constantly work fixing things before they break, moving from one life cycle to another. Another one of those natural processes at work that's pulling you down is Parkinson's law. Parkinson was a British admiral who, quite known in, in management circles, he published something like 60 books. But he's most noted for his observation that work creates work that expenses left alone will rise to meet revenues or income. The business will become unsustainable simply by existing unless you are at work constantly eliminating and simplifying what's taking place. A new report goes in, something needs to go away. Uh, a new rule goes in, look and see if there aren't some you can get rid of. Uh, work creates work. It's one of the ironies of this world that that's what happens often in government when we, when we address a problem by adding money to it. What we do is create more work, which actually reduces our output to begin with. Then I'm sure you're all familiar with the concept of the opportunity wedge, which you probably heard as, you know, 
the day you were born, you could be a sanitation engineer or you could be president of the United States or the world, for that matter. But as events occur in life, or events occur around you, the opportunities available begin to diminish until ultimately you come to that sharp point at the end of the, of the opportunity wedge, and you are what you are, and you can't be anything else. The opportunity wedge applies to businesses as well. And your objective is to try to keep those lines as parallel as you can. Certainly, you try to keep them from closing on the right-hand side of the opportunity wedge. One of the things that I'd like to talk about is the Underwood typewriter company. It doesn't exist. Because Underwood decided that it was a typewriter company. And when typewriters were no longer the preferred method for creating documents, it disappeared as a company. Contrast that to Apple and to Jobs, who would not let Apple become just a computer company. And as a result, he went on, and Apple went on, to change the world. Peter Drucker identified five traits that any established organization will develop over time that are all negative, that are all will cause the organization to lose market share and eventually, if they're unchecked, to disappear. I'm not going to go into all of them now. Again, you can read the book. But again, you have to be aware of what those negative traits are. And you have to be constantly alert to try to avoid them. But if change is so pervasive, if it is a constant in our lives, then we better understand change. We better know what it looks like in order to just endure it. And we need to understand it if we are to manage it. And we must manage it. This is the change curve. You see, when we purposely make change, we do it because we want to move from one level of benefit or performance to a higher level of benefit or performance. But it doesn't work that way. There's no smooth, linear line to go from where we started from to where we want to go. Instead, change causes a sharp downward spike in benefit or performance. Things get worse. I talk about a commercial that I remember in a telephone receptionist that's looking at the camera, looking into the camera, and saying, you know, when they put this new telephone system in, they said it was going to make everything so much better. But if you ask me, it's just made things horribly worse. You see, she's a victim of a lack of management change. Change only turns up out of the valley of despair over time. And it only does so through a process called cash. Those affected by the change must acquire new knowledge. That's what user manuals and training sessions are. And that's what help desks are. And then if you take that with the right attitude, people will acquire new skills that they need and it is when they become habit that we move up to achieve our targeted um, objective. In this case, uh, our telephone receptionist was not given a new knowledge. She was not trained. She didn't have somebody from the company standing over her shoulder as the system first came up to help and guide her through the first couple of hours. They didn't have somebody in the office with some of the older members of the staff, for example, to help them figure out how to put calls on hold and transfer calls during the first uh, time that, uh, uh, that they were trying to use the system. Eventually, people in the office will learn what they need to learn. They'll go on to achieve the benefits. But there are plenty of other kinds of changes that can simply put an organization out of business. Think about it in terms of you own a restaurant, it's a pizza problem, and you decide you're going to open a new one. What if you decided to open five of them at the same time, for example? I promise you, none of them would exist if you did. 
because the downward spike would be so great that you probably would never recover from it. In the book, I talk about right ways and wrong ways to implement change. I talk about the things that you can do to manage change, to manage that process, uh, to help flatten that downward spike and to help pull it up and so forth. Again, you can get that by going to the books. But I want to move forward a little bit with, with the, kind of the platform we've built talking about this so far. To talk about what successful organizations specifically do differently. And they do five things. They engage in the planning process. They set goals and objectives. They develop plans for achieving those goals. They prepare their team for opportunities and contingencies. And they measure progress and hold people accountable. The last one is one of the things that I would say that I think many of our governments find most difficult to do. But let's talk about how they do those things because the secret is not only that they do them, but it is how they approach them and how they do them. First, what is a plan? It isn't a bound book. It's not a free ring binder that has been put together by some group and goes on a bookshelf and nobody ever looks at. It's a playbook. It's a communication tool. Its purpose is to communicate to the team, to bring the team together. Just like a coach has a playbook and changes that playbook throughout the season. It's the totality of the communication from the boss's um, uh, blog or tweets uh, to the firm's uh, extranet, uh, its websites, uh, its brochures. Uh, it, is a, it is a playbook. It is giving people a common sense of direction of where you want to go. And the more people you can involve in coming up with that playbook, the better. It is important to understand also that whatever those plans are, that they are based on guesses about the future. Therefore, anything in it has to be a temporary target because the future is too inaccurate for it to become a reliable tool to base any plan on. And therefore, to, the, to plan without an expectation of changing the plan is mere folly. It is also important to understand that the purpose of the plan is more than anything else to provide people with a line that you can communicate changes from. Because it's a dynamic process. The plan gives people guidance for making decisions down on the front line. But decisions made on the front line in the face of reality come back to change the plan. So it's a dynamic process. Just as a coach has to change the plan throughout the season, and as they face different uh, uh, adversaries on, on the field. In developing the plan, they also practice something I call management candy, when they talk about setting those objectives. Management candy, m and stands for main things with the minimum resources required to achieve the objective. And by that, I mean that one has to say, what is the main thing that our success depends upon? Not only as an organization as a whole, but carried down into each area. So that in the mail room, for example, or anything, they have to answer the question, what is the main thing my success depends on in relationship to what the company is trying to accomplish? But then they have to say one more thing. And this one more thing is probably one of the most important things that I can leave you with today. You have to say, what are the minimum resources required for me to achieve that main thing? That's hard for people to understand. Because many people will think that means trying to do things on the cheap. It doesn't mean that at all. Let me give you an example. In the case of jurors, when I first started that company, we 
had to answer that question of what was the main thing that our success depends upon to establish ourselves as a national uh, software company uh, for multi-attorney law firms. And at that time, there was no such thing as the internet. There was no such thing as collaborative software. The only way we could reach that market was having boots on the ground, but we didn't have the resources. We didn't have people to put those boots on the ground. So we said, the main thing our success depended upon, we already knew we had the product, we knew we had the software, it's the main thing that we needed to succeed. We needed those boots on the ground. Our strategy for getting them, dealers. But then the next question was, what's the minimum number of dealers we can have to reach that market and that objective? And we said we have to have dealers in 17 major metropolitan markets. Only 17. We didn't say that we needed 100 dealers. We didn't say that we needed 300 dealers. We said we needed 17. And we got them. But there were a lot of organizations like ours that said, oh, we got to have a dealer's program, so let's go out and see if we can't get a couple hundred of them. This is the lesson that we need to learn. It comes back to parks and small. It's called the rule of the fewest. And it's why minimum things is so important in the management candy concept. The top part of this pictograph represents the communication between a company that has only two employees. A and B. A can communicate with B. B can communicate with A. That's the only way communication can occur. Look at what happens when you add employee C. Now think, what happens when you add D and E and F and G and H? And pretty soon you have to go to the pyramidal organization with all the problems that it uh, represents as well. But the lesson here is to say, Wherever you're starting from, the more things you attempt to deploy, the more things that you add to it, the more difficult it will be to achieve the objective. At any one time, you don't want any more dealers than you have to have. If we'd gone after 300 dealers, we would have spent all of our time screening, all of our time recruiting, all of our time trying to mentor and we would have never succeeded. It would have consumed all of our existing resources because it would have outbalanced them. At any one time, you want no more product variations than you have to have to achieve your objective. No more products, no more employees, no more prospects. And you can say, how could that be? But let me answer the question. If I said the world was my market, what's my advertising budget? If I say that my market is Franklin, how much does it cost me to reach the market? The rule of the fewest is fundamental to the success and build of a business over the long haul. You have to implement things in relationship to your capacity to deploy it. Uh, so, management came an essential concept in business. Preparing people for contingencies uh, and opportunities. One of the things that I've always recommended is that the management team or a group, as many people as can be effective, get together once a month, half day, maybe every couple of weeks, and just speculate on things that could happen. Another Katrina, uh, you know, another Enron. Mexico takes over all American businesses. One pay system is implemented in our healthcare program. And speculate on how you as a, could respond to that with an emphasis on responding to it as an opportunity. Over time, you'd be surprised that often future events could come close to mirroring some of the things that you speculated on. But what you will really have developed is the muscle memory in the brain as to how to deal with events that surprise other people so that you and quickly process them and try to put them in the groove to be uh, um, valuable as opportunities to you. And of course, the final concept of those five things is measurement and holding people accountable. Measurement alone improves performance. Why else would you hear the cry 
you know, it's a new world record. Why would golfers always try to beat their last, uh, you know, and uh, lower their handicap, if you will? Uh, cyclists improve their time. Measurement alone improves performance. But the other ingredient, holding people accountable, is essential. Long, companies that are successful in the long term are meritocracies. Holding people accountable isn't always about punishment. Yes, people can lose their job. The CEO doesn't achieve their objective, can be on the market. But it, it is more often than not, it is about how people are recognized, how people are compensated. They're compensated for their contributions to the goals and objectives of the organization. And that's holding people accountable. So now you know what you now you know what you need to know to succeed in the long haul. You have to understand the two certainties. You have to practice common courtesy. You have to be fixing things before they break. You have to be simplifying and eliminating. You have to understand the change curve. And you have to do those five things that we talked about. But there's still something missing. And this is it. This is what you came for. Peter Drucker said there's only one sound objective, and it is the pursuit of excellence. Anything that comes is at best common, and that leads to marginal. Tom Peters and Nancy Austin said succinctly that there are only two ways, only two ways to achieve and sustain superior performance for the long haul. And this is true regardless of what business you're in, if you're in the chicken business or the jet engine business or the healthcare or any business. And that is first, you have to provide exceptional customer care through superior quality of service and product. And second, you have to practice constant innovation. They're the only way you can achieve it. Long-term success depends on exceptional customer care, constant innovation, constantly changing, uh, constantly fixing things before they break. It is the model of excellence. excellence. You cannot achieve it without people having the right people on the bus who truly care about their customers. They don't get lip service to it. They don't say this would be a great company if it wasn't for customers. They truly care. They're an organization that likes their customers and wants to be liked by their customers. And if they achieve excellence, they can only achieve it through the eyes of the people who judge them, their customers. They don't determine when they achieve excellence. Only those that judge them can. And if you achieve it, you can only maintain it through constant innovation, constantly improving the organization and evolving. The true value of businesses today is not in your product, your service, it's not in the tangible assets, it's in your ability to evolve, it's in your ability to innovate, it's your ability to adjust, to innovate, to move um, as the dense move. It's so simple and yet it is so difficult. It's customer care, constant. And now I'll turn the floor to you. How do you uh, how do you measure the customer um, satisfaction? You know, the beautiful thing in that model for excellence that I just set up on screen, and I didn't mention at the very bottom of it, it had some initials. One of them was for management by wandering around. And that used to be the only way that you could get in touch leadership. That's the only way that you could really find out what was happening in the business, including customer satisfaction. You had to get out there face to face. But today, we have these unbelievable tools, social media and so forth. Businesses today can know what their customers are thinking through social media if they make it accessible to their customers. The companies out there, like Bizarre Voice, which is one of them, they're the companies that do those five stars that you see everywhere. But literally, they give you the capability 
for you to know almost instantly what your customers think about changes that you made to a product or changes that you made to a service or complaints. But you've got to make it easy for them to do it. You've got to make it out there. You can do all kinds of surveys. Unfortunately, most of them are pretty self-serving. They're often designed to convince you rather than to get the truth from you. So the best way to get that is to create the vehicle for customers to communicate back to the organization and to put in place the obonsman or whatever the people um, you know who will who will take those things and and and, and you know and and you know and where the where the organization can respond to them. Tell a story. My wife bought a new toothbrush years ago and she couldn't hold it. She tried to brush her teeth and turn it in her hand. So she wrote the company and she says, You got a problem with this toothbrush. I mean, I'm trying to brush my teeth and keeps turning it. They wrote her back, gave her some coupons to get some free toothbrushes, and said, you know, it's funny. Nobody else has had that problem. Two months later, they were on the market with rubberized camel on their, on their toothbrushes, which is a pretty common thing, I guess. But uh, it's uh, interesting. Uh, they obviously, somebody obviously got the message, but the first reaction uh, was to uh, defend it, to say that you're the problem, you're the customer, you're the problem. Mm -hmm. rather than you. That's a kind of side. But that's the answer to it. Social media uh, gives us a tremendous opportunity to communicate with our customers and, and get that information back. Uh, you know, White House even responds if you get 100,000 people to, to, to go on their deficit, but you've got to have 100,000 people to get their attention. Anybody else? Or do you not like that? No, it's really good. Um, if I may add something, you know, I do receive some of those uh, surveys that you mentioned, and some companies do a very short one, I like them, you know, in two minutes, three minutes, I'm done. Some of them, I think they are built based on your responses. I mean, they just continue, continue until I just stop. Give up. I yeah. give up. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah. And I wonder if this company, yeah. what exactly they are trying to do here, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta make it easy. I, I just got a survey from Google for their Google Glass, which I'm trying to evaluate. Anybody else into Google Glass? All right. This is where you actually yeah, have a thing that you're wearing on your eye. And you, you see that? It's a great concept, but it doesn't work. So, yeah. Yes? Um, you've obviously been a successful businessman, entrepreneur for many, many years. Was there like one thing that finally inspired you to put them all together in a book? And would you have any advice for people who maybe have never even thought about writing a book before? But well, I would start by buying my book and buy it for everybody in your organization. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, I, I'm, I'm serious about that. In fact, that's one of the, the handouts. It says, why should you buy the bulk purchases of, of the book? is that it is a teaching tool. I wrote it as a teaching tool. It's a self-help book in a way, but it really is, is a, it really is a teaching tool that if you took this book and used it to teach these concepts to the people in your organization, uh, I promise you that it will make a tremendous difference. Uh, I will also say, that I'm not saying that this is the, um, you know, this this is the end at all, because there I'm sure there will be things about your business that, you know, I may not have really touched on in the book, and you may, you know, want to expand on on on, on the book in terms of doing that. What you're really doing is one of the things I often say about businesses is there's no such thing as corporate memory. Businesses make the same mistakes over and over and over and over again. Uh, they reinvent the wheel. They don't, there, there's no corporate memory. This is a corporate memory. This is a business memory. This is, this is trying to teach people uh, the essentials. I mean, again, uh, you can hear about the rule of the fused, but until you've lived it, until you say, guys, we really messed up on this one, and let me show you why, okay? We abandoned the rule of the fewest. 
It doesn't take many of those, okay, before the concept comes home. Uh, there are lots of things in the book we haven't talked about. Suboptimization. Uh, you know, suboptimization you know, is when one area puts their objectives and is superior to those in the organization. It's got a legal department, the legal department doesn't want you to get sued, that becomes their main objectives and you want to sell product. And, and the legal contracts are getting in the way. Mailroom doesn't want to have any overtime and you're not getting product out to customers. I mean, uh, but um, I'm rambling to a certain extent, but what I'm saying is that I call it a language of excellence because the value is the use of this in the business. It's the use of it in day to day. It's, it's, it's being able to, to, in the course of your conversations with your people, being able to go back and reference um, these concepts. Um, you reference them through their trigger words or name, it brings the mental uh, pictographs, uh, images uh, to their mind and moves things from the back of the mind to the front of the mind, if you will. Tom, yes. when you sold Juris to LexisNexis, what was that process about? Was, did they come to you or did you go out marketing and come? Well, uh, no, I, I, you know, we went out and uh, hired a company to assist us in this process. That people that uh, do this sort of thing. Uh, although I've done some in my uh, old life where I was the person out putting them together. But, but, uh, but we went to someone you know, who had those kind of contacts out there to develop this. And why did we do this when we did it? Uh, this gets back to uh, the statement that uh, you know, chance favors the prepared mind. Uh, in 2007, I looked at the economic and political environment at the time, and I said, things aren't looking where I want them to go, and I've just recovered from cancer, and I think now's a good time to sell the business. Right after we sell the business, you know, the stock market went poof. So, right place, right time. But it was also the prepared mind work. Yes? Yes, I'm impressed by your publications, and I wonder how did you get your a publisher? Did you go through a literary agent, or how did that process work for you? Well, the process for you is probably different than the process for me. I was 66 when I started writing, and most of the literary agents out there are younger than you are. I think most of them are still in high school, I think. They look like they're still in high school. So I said, no, I'm not playing that game. So I self-published. So all of my books are self-published. I created my own publishing company, uh, which is called I-65 North, in fact. Uh, and uh, uh, primarily, I use Ingram uh, and their printable demand uh, processes uh, to do that. Uh, it can take you, if you have a completed manuscript, it's worth publishing. It can take as long as three to five years really for you to go through the process of getting an agent and whatever. And at 66, I didn't. At 66, I was a counselor survivor. I wasn't sure I had five years. So. And the reason I ask, I tried um, independent uh, options like Queer Space and so on, but their conditions are not very favorable for an author who is not influential in terms of uh, negotiations or to be able to to ask for a better price because they will give you like 30 cents for a dollar or even 30 percent or less from the sales. I wonder whether there's a better way. Well, uh, ebooks are unbelievable. I mean, you, you can get an ebook out there and Amazon will pay you 70 percent royalties, uh, for example, on it. And uh, um, of course, the, 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 you may not sell any books, so I don't, 70 percent of nothing is, you know. Not a lot. Uh, I would say to you that there aren't really very many uh, writers who've gotten rich as writers. Uh, I think to be successful as a writer, you either have to be able to afford to be a writer, you have to already be famous, or get arrested. So, <laughs> try one of those. Getting arrested might be the easiest process. All right, we're probably going to try to bring this to a conclusion. Uh, uh,
Have, have we gotten those cards from everybody? Anybody need to fill out a card for our drawing or if they want a copy of this, my slides or anything? If you do, hold up your hand. Copy of the slide. Okay. Copy of the slide. All right. You do. I Go think it's in the... Oh, it's in there? Okay. Yeah, All right. You got it. Tom, we have a little surprise for you. Oh? We have, uh, State Representative Glenn Cassida is uh, joining us tonight. This is his fifth stop tonight, <laughs> so he's a busy man. And um, he's one of the good guys in government, works really hard. And he's got something special for you. So we made a special stop. Glenn? Tom? Glenn? Tom, how are, how are you? Good Hello. to see you again. What I have here, and, and uh, from time to time, the legislature recognizes people who have done and accomplished good things and things to be honored and recognized. And so what I have here, Tom, is a proclamation from the Speaker of the House and signed by Senator Jack Johnson and myself. And the, uh, the well, it was my eyes, I'm in trouble now. <laughs> <laughs> the proclamation looks like this, and it goes on to, to describe, Tom, the, the business ventures you've been involved in, uh, names that everyone here would know from Indata to Compass, uh, your innovative in the software technology that you created uh, became actually the, the software for large law firms, I understand. Uh, and I, would, I do want to read one or two little pieces if you would allow me to. And, and, I always uh, <laughs> love it. One of my favorite subjects is me. <laughs> Besides his business endeavors, uh, Tom is a cancer survivor, as he alluded to earlier. And in addition to that, he is now a... Uh, well-published author, both in fiction and nonfiction, And so you have lived a very successful life, and it sounds like it's just begun. But I want to read, if I could, one of the whereas's. Whereas Tom Collins is the recipient of several awards for his business leadership, including a Lifetime Achievement Award from Law Technology News for his contribution to the use of technology in the legal community, and was named one of the top 100 global tech leaders in the legal community by the London-based published City Tech which is both of those awards are no small thing. And so it's, it's neat to be amongst men who have accomplished great things and, and is recognized. And this is that, this is that small thing. And so Speaker Harwell, myself, and Jack John have signed that proclamation recognizing Tom, you and your accomplishments. And thank you for your time. I do have one other thing. No money, but a hug, is that kind of <laughs> One other thing, every year the state legislature puts out something called a blue book. And it's a, it is a neat read. And uh, the library has several copies and gets new copies every year. It's just about Tennessee and all about state government and our history. Uh, this year, they're orange. Or only a few are actually orange, Tom, in memory of Pat Head Summit and her accomplishment oh. in coaching UT. Oh. So you have one of the orange blue books, and it's a good read. Thank you, Tom. So if you buy Tom's book, then you can have a state representative give you a proclamation. <laughs> <laughs> here, we'll do a quick photo. Yes. Okay, here we go. Um, And for those of you who don't know, this is Dolores. She's small, but she's mighty. And she <laughs> runs the Williamson County Library System. So thank you, Dolores. Thank you. We have plenty of food. Uh, Tom is going to be signing books. And I think you're doing a drawing now as well? Yes, we're going to do a drawing. We're sure are. We're going to give some things away. Okay. Uh, and uh, then uh, to make things easy, I've just priced all the books tonight, including the audio book at $25. These are all signed hardbacks, although the books are available as e-books and others if you prefer that. Uh, so if you would like a book, you can come up and get it, but right now we're going to give away some prizes. Uh. I need doors. Would you come here and do the honors, please? First one we're going to give away is the audio 
copy of the audio edition of the Claire Carter. Okay, and this goes to Edmund, Cabagambo. Who? All right, the second one is uh, you get your choice of any of the signed hardcover books up here, any of them, your choice. And the winner is? Janice Robinson. Uh, ben, if you have not read any of these, the Claire Murders is the most recent uh, mystery, and it takes place during the 2010 flood. If you're a mystery reader, it's more than just a Take your pick. All right, and then I'll sign it for you later. All right, so now we're going to give away, in the honor of the concept of fixing before it breaks, we're going to give some fixing before it breaks kits. <laughs> okay, and this one goes to Carl G A U H. It was hard All to right. Carl Long Carl. And we have a second picture Okay. This goes to Nancy Bowman. Oh my gosh. Thank you. And finally, we have an Amazon gift certificate. And that goes to Mike Owen. Welcome to Poets from the Neighborhood. I'm Louise Collin. And I'm George Spain. And we're going to read you some poetry. Poetry by your friends and neighbors. The Smell of Leather by Sherry Page. I remember this smell of leather, the first time a dank day stilled us after a long run. Trees were high and bright as flags waving. Faces glistened from the teamed effort to get to this rise on the land. Lungs filled with sweet breathing, a kind that only happens here. Great hearts beneath us sorting out and their pleasure to be so alive. I remember as turkey buzzards graced the blue above like angel kites, you turning to whisper, God is in this place and we knew we followed more than foxes. At First Light by Gail Bunton Hyduck. The drive on the far side of the frosty field leads away straight and deep to the nestled house, still sleeping in the hushed chill of the breaking light. If melody is nourishment, harmony is healing by Amy E. Hall. Do you ever wish you could drink music first in soft sips, then steady swallows, and at times greedy gulps? I need constant installments, like doses of medicine, carefully measured out by the hours, days, and weeks of the month. It moves me like the majesty of a mountain, the splendor of a sunrise, the openness of an ocean, like the moment you know that you're home. Baby, Baby Mine by Susie Margaret Ross. In the Waffle House, I listened to the jukebox and ate my waffles. They were devils with pecans and that sweet sticky syrup. Baby, baby mine, the singer was calling. Please, please come home. Too late, too late, I murmured and gobbled up my bacon. Thank you for being with us today. 